Well, I think for OpenAI, we had some sense of what they were up to. We had actually talked about it back in December when one of their earlier models came out. But I think there's really two big takeaways. Um, these may sound like they're in contradiction, but I actually think they're complementary to one another. The first is, like, there should be no mistake, this is a very impressive model that they have released. Um, the second point is, and there's been a lot of reporting on that, CNBC has done some reporting, others have, that some of the initial information about the state and nature of the technology has evolved a bit. You know, it may not be quite as cheap as people had indicated where some of the information came from, but I think the big, big takeaway from both of those points is that uh, it confirms something that we have been saying for some time, we open AI, which is that there is this very real competition between US-led, small d, democratic AI, and CCP, China-led, autocratic, authoritarian AI. There's two countries in the world that can build this at scale. Imagine if there were only two countries in the world that could build electricity at scale. And that's sort of how you have to think about it. Um, and so for us, what DeepSeek really reinforces and reaffirms is that there is this very real competition with very real stakes at play. And there was a, a while when there were many who thought, you know, China were quite far behind when it came to the development, particularly of these foundational models. Yeah. They pointed to things like restriction to access uh, to hardware, yeah. in particular the GPUs, yeah. uh, and multiple other factors. But actually what DeepSeek has shown, and not just DeepSeek, we've seen it from yeah. Alibaba and others as well, that there's some serious innovation going on. Yeah. And actually, perhaps at this point in time, in terms of models, they're on par. What does the next two or three years look like in your view? It's a great question. Um, I would say, you know, in terms of where the competition is right now, the US uh, AI still has a lead. I mean, the model that DeepSeek put out was very similar to a model that OpenAI put out back in September. And since then, we've even released some updated versions. But I think what, what your question is really getting at is a concept that we think about, and it's infrastructure is destiny. You know, ultimately, the competition between democratic AI and autocratic AI is going to be determined by compute. And let me unpack that for a second. Compute is just the raw computing power that you need to build these AI frontier models to then do the applications for it. And there are a couple elements that go into compute. It is data, it is chips, it is energy, and it is talent. And if you look at China, they have some inherent strengths. As an authoritarian country, they have tremendous access, infinite access to data. Energy, they just brought on 10 nuclear power facilities the last year, another 10 is scheduled to come on this year. Obviously a ton of talent in that country. You were there, you've reported, you've, you've seen it. On the chips, maybe a little bit behind, but they're throwing enormous resources at it. Um, I think US-led AI, Democratic-led AI, does have one big advantage in all of this, and that is capitalism, democratic societies, that empower its people to be developers, builders, innovators, entrepreneurs, the people who watch CNBC. Um, and we do have to take full advantage of that. So I think you know, one of the real challenges for all of us um, who want to see small d democratic AI is are we thinking about ways to really facilitate, encourage, promote, advance, Innovation. We released something called an innovation blueprint a couple weeks ago, and it was really built and organized around this idea that if we do want to make sure that democratic AI becomes the AI that the world uses, like we do have to really lean into the innovation, and that ultimately means making sure we have the infrastructure to create the compute that then drives these systems. But just, just a slight counterline of sure. thinking, I guess, Chris, in, in that the compute is obviously incredibly important, and infrastructure yeah. we know is incredibly important. One of the lines of thinking that came out after sort of Deep Seek's model was actually, if there can be efficiency gains, is there too much capex right now into infrastructure yeah. and compute? Because maybe we can do more with less. Yeah, so let's uh, the, the couple dynamics to this. Um, first, and again, I want to acknowledge it's a, really, it's a really strong model. I think a lot of information that subsequently come out that indicated it was not quite at the price point that people talked about. Secondly, and this gets really confusing unless you're spending a ton of time in AI, there's a difference between a frontier model, think of that as like the big engine, right? And an inference model, which is a smaller model that specifically drives specific uses. Within inference, you have something called reasoning, right? Which is a version of how the AI is working. What DeepSeek is, is a reasoning model. 
both us and DeepSeek and really a bunch of AI companies have seen the efficiencies in reasoning really come down. I mean, we just released a paper from Sam Altman, our CEO, that has documented that over a year we saw 150% decrease in the costs of doing some of these inference, particularly the reasoning model. So we've already been seeing that. But even as the costs come down, more and more people are then using those models, which then drives up the need for even more compute. And so that's just even on one slice. Then you come back to the big engine, the frontier models. Those frontier models, it's pretty clear, and it's really you know, almost a mathematical formula. The more resources you put into compute, you get exponential growth in the power of those models. And so both on the inference side and on the frontier side, it is really clear that you're going to need an enormous amount of compute, which then is going to require an enormous amount of infrastructure. And if you bring it all the way back to the geopolitics, it really is going to come down to which of these two countries are able to leverage and access the most infrastructure to support the compute that they need as this plays out. So countries are going to have to pick a side? I think, um, I think at the end of the day, you're going to have these two big models out there. You're going to have an authoritarian one and a small d democratic one. I think on the natural, most places in the world would prefer to be building their systems. If you think about this as a nation building technology, they would prefer to be doing it on small d democratic AI, the AI that's infused with democratic values of freedom and choice and agency and knowledge. And if you're a country and you're looking to build your own AI ecosystem, your own AI hub, you're building developers in your country which are going to be some version of the companies of the future, I think you would prefer to be seen that built on a, on a democratic AI system because it's going to facilitate your country being able to use this technology for your own nation building purposes. We've spoken a lot about the position of, of the US and of, of China, for example. Where's Europe in this conversation? Because we talk more and more yes. about, there it is, we talk more and more about sovereign AI, or sovereign cloud, and, right. and Europe has been pushing this notion of uh, having a European champion yep. around the model space as yes. well. And you've seen some new competitors come out of Europe as well. So yep. how do you envisage that landscape playing out in terms of Europe's relationship with the US when it comes to AI? Yep. At the same time, there's increasing tension with, with the US and Europe with yep. a new administration in certain areas. Yeah, you know, you do sort of, even here in the first couple hours of this conference, um, you can get this sense that there's almost this fork in the road, maybe a, even a tension right now, uh, between a Europe at the EU level that is looking at a you know, fairly significant, heavier regulatory approach, and then some of the countries, a France, a Germany, a UK, although not technically in the EU, certainly European, they're looking to maybe go in a little bit of a different direction that actually wants to embrace the innovation I mean, you guys have covered the Draghi report extensively, right? It warned about low growth, aging population, the technology gap that exists between Europe and the US. I do think some of these countries are beginning to recognize that if you do want to build some version of nation building sovereign AI, that you are going to need to lean more into innovation and embracing innovation. And you know, a lot of the conversations at, at, at the prior two conferences here, and understandably so, you know, there was one in Bletchley Park two years ago and then Korea last year, has really sort of focused and, and, and indexed on the risk piece. Um, but I think this conference you're beginning to see maybe a different definition or consideration that perhaps the bigger risk right now is missing out on the opportunity and that if we want to get the economic growth from this technology, I mean, this is an inherently productive technology. Uh, it's not an extractive technology. It's not social media. This is not the last wave of technology which you know, some people could make a credible argument was coming into Europe, extracting money from Europe, economics from Europe, going to shareholders, right? This is technology that's inherently productive in terms of how it can be used. And I think you are beginning to see people understanding that, hey, this isn't social media, this is a productive technology. How do we make sure we're leaning into innovation so it happens here? Mm. So, so, so that brings me to the question where, where you've got this increasing kind of tension between also sort of Europe and even particularly countries within the EU yeah. 
and the US, but at the same time that there is a, a common ground in many areas. Uh, How does that relationship play out in, I, I, in the tech sphere? Yeah, I think, first of all, I think that, that there's far more in common uh, you know, amongst these countries than there are ultimately uh, differences. Uh, I think the way, you know, I, I think a concrete way this is going to play out is the following which is for Europe, for a Germany, for a France, for a UK, and the UK has been very aggressive in thinking about how they lean into this. For the countries that are really looking to embrace the innovation, they're ultimately going to need the infrastructure that we talked about. To get that infrastructure, they're going to need to attract capital, not just capital from Europe, not just government capital. They're going to need to get pensions, sovereigns, syndicates. Um, and for them to be able to attract that capital, they're going to need to be able to have a regulatory structure where that capital thinks it's going to be able to create the type of AI systems to create economic returns that model out for them. Um, a, a reason why you get the investment in the U.S., uh, you know, we just recently announced a $500 billion investment. We did it with President Trump, our partners, Oracle and SoftBank, is because people feel comfortable investing that money in the U.S. because they do have a sense that there's an economic model that is very viable there. And I think what's overhanging a lot of the conversations here is, okay, we want to build out our own AI ecosystem. To have that ecosystem, we actually need the infrastructure to scale. To get the infrastructure, we need the capital. We can't get that capital if we're going to have a regulatory framework that's going to make it very difficult for us to actually build these companies. Chris, you mentioned President Trump there. You spent a lot of time yeah. on Capitol Hill in the U.S. And if, I, if I took my shirt off, you'd see all the scars. Yeah. <laughs> no one wants to see those, by the way, yeah. and under any situation. <laughs> well, from the early days of the Trump administration, what are your initial impressions in terms of the way the administration is going to approach AI policy yeah. and potentially even regulation? Yeah, so I think this is an administration that gets up uh, in the morning every day and really thinks about this from that competition angle. Um, both national security and economic competition, particularly uh, in, in, in this competition with the Chinese Communist Party-led country of China. That's how they think about it. Um, and so I think when they make decisions on regulations, on investment, on infrastructure, it's all through that prism. Um, and I do think that they are really going to come at this, and look, it's two and a half weeks, I guess, into the administration. I do think that there is the likelihood that there's going to be a real holistic strategy in terms of how they approach it. I think you can make the argument over the last four years or so in the U.S., there hasn't necessarily been that coherent strategy, that's somewhat understandable because the technology was still nascent and emerging. But I think you are now at this moment where there is an understanding that there's a real competition. Uh, the technology, the pace of this technology, the acceleration of it. Sam, again, our CEO, talked about the fact that AGI, which is sort of the next big thing in AI, uh, could potentially happen over the course of the Trump presidency. Yeah. And so you've got where the technology is going, you've got the competition piece, and then you've got the piece that I think really gets this administration uh, juiced up and excited, which is the idea that you can attract enormous capital into the U.S. to invest in this. I mean, we had put out a document a little while ago that showed that there's about $175 billion in dry capital allocated, existing right now, to invest in AI infrastructure. And I think with President Trump coming into office, that has really served as an unlock for that capital uh, because they do believe that with this president, there, there is going to be the ability to go build this infrastructure you know, on a schedule and at a pace that makes sense in terms of, uh, of the allocation of that capital. Chris, I have two very quick questions. Sure. I know you have to run. Yep. Can we just quickly talk about the Elon Musk factor sure. in government as yep. well? He's very close to the president at the moment. He's yep. part of his uh, advisory cabinet in Doge and all that, or everything else. Um, what impact do you think Elon Musk is going to have in the way that Trump and the administration approaches AI, particularly for someone who has uh, clearly, you know, aired his dissatisfaction with open AI? Yeah, look, at, at, at the end of the day on the open AI question, I think it's really clear that for the U.S. to win, for the U.S. to prevail, for the U.S. to be the premier leader in artificial intelligence, that open AI has to be at the center of that conversation. We actually did an event last week in Washington, D.C., where we brought in senior administration officials, cabinet secretaries, senior folks from the White House. We also brought in folks from both sides of the aisle in Congress, Senate, and House, and actually did a closed-door session where we previewed where the capabilities were going. 
And the most amazing thing about that session, I guess beyond just seeing the, the demonstration of the technology, was the fact that you did have people from across the spectrum in a room, and they were actually substantively talking about how do we make sure that we're taking this technology and advancing it so that it does help put the US in the strongest possible position. And so, it's a long-winded way of saying that I do think whoever is in and around the president, whether it's Elon, whoever it may be, uh, presumably they're there because they do want to see the US lead on this, and that OpenAI ends up being in the middle of that conversation just because, um, and you know, I'm, I want to be humble and respectful, but we are amongst, if not the premier builder of this technology. And funding for Stargate, is that there, despite what Elon Moving claims? forward, really excited. So like, the money's there? Man, oh yeah, I mean, we're, we already have a project up and going in Abilene, Texas. You guys should come down <laughs> and check it out. We'll give you a tour, maybe get you from London or from Paris to Abilene. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's really exciting. You know, we have $100 billion that we you know, project going out fairly quickly in the near future, then 500 billion you know, over the course of this. And you know, as we were just talking about, um, you know, there's an enormous return model on AI infrastructure because of the supply and demand uh, component of this. These frontier models are going to require an enormous amount of compute. And even as the price and efficiencies come down on how a, a normal person, everyday person is using this, that's driving up uh, the need for more compute because even more people are using it.